Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, coming to our seminar today. It's a pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Marta Blois from the, the Department of Applied Mathematics at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, Dr. Abovic is a professor in the, and the chair of Applied Math at the University of Colorado. Uh, he graduated with his BS in Mechanical Engineering, so he's not totally strange to our world. Uh, from the University of Rochester and his PhD in Mathematics from MIT. Uh, he's received numerous honors uh, throughout his career, including the Alfred P. Sloan F uh, Foundation Fellowship, the John Simon Guggenheim uh, Fellowship. He's extensively well published. Uh, I was just uh, absolutely flabbergasted by the number of books and uh, papers he's, uh, uh, he's published. And, uh, principally in nonlinear phenomena and physical uh, applied mathematics. And uh, in fact, he'll be talking about nonlinear waves from beaches to photonics. Now, I don't know where the beaches in Colorado are, but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, They're far away. <laughs> Got to go on a plane ride three it's, miles south. It's, it's, it's uh, a pleasure to have <laughs> it's, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me, and it's my pleasure to uh, listen to many interesting conversations this morning on data analysis, and also nice to see some old friends and colleagues from a while ago and more recent. So, <clears throat> not only waves, from oceans to photonic graphene, these are two topics that at first glance look totally different. I mean, what is there? Even remotely similar here. Well, these are uh, problems of wave phenomena. And when I think of wave phenomena, yes, there are certain aspects of wave phenomena that catch my attention, and they come out of the equations that govern their dynamics. And what I'm mostly interested in is understanding equations that have the key phenomena that come from the governing original equations and try to remove all of the spurious, if you will, information and get out to the, the main information, the main issues. OK. Well, waves have been around for a long time, right? I mean, forever. And um, from a mathematical perspective, it's interested people for many years, as we'll see in my conversation with you. And in recent years, the study of nonlinear waves, waves with large amplitude, in a big field. Well, uh, for two, uh, for general interest, I give you two figures, both from uh, Japanese artist Hakusai. The first is a fast cargo boat, and the second, the great wave. The second is very famous, and many of you probably have seen it. The fast cargo boat is, this is a cargo boat right here, and fast maybe because there's a lot of guys in it, can't see it so well. Ah, you see them right there. Here they are. Yes, right there. Um, and the cargo boat at the top also. Yeah. And the great wave, this is very famous. There you see the fury of a wave and in the background of Mount Fuji. So what's this lecture going to be? Uh, an introduction. Well, I'll talk about the history of water waves because some of the phenomena we're interested in is localized waves. If you saw that first figure, you saw that big, freak, hump-like wave. It's a localized wave, effectively. So I'll talk about localized waves and solitons, and applications, water waves, and problems in photonic lattices, and conclude. Well, uh, water waves <coughs> come from the inviscid equations of fluid mechanics set out by Euler back in the 1750s. That wasn't enough just to have those equations. You had to have the correct boundary conditions. And there is uh, Euler. If you look at this figure here and look at his right eye, you'll see it's a little droopy because he uh, had some problems with his eyes. And he eventually became blind, but still wrote many, many papers and books, even when he had no vision. In 1813, the French Academy of Sciences announced a prize competition for water waves. I want to understand water waves. Maybe you can build better boats, <coughs> naval 
people to compete with their neighbors across the English Channel. At any rate, uh, in 1816, Cauchy was awarded the prize for solving the initial value problem. It's not trivial. There's some tricks there. And of course, he had to use some non-trivial math and he used Fourier's work. And it was probably one of the early applications of Fourier transforms. And uh, there is Cauchy with Fourier and Poisson. Poisson was a judge on the committee. And he wrote papers as well, submitted it to the committee. I don't understand how that works. You're a judge on the committee, you submit, submit a paper, which isn't accepted. Well, I guess he had some ideas and he wanted to get it out. 1830s, the British Association for the Advancement of Science set up a committee on waves. And one of its uh, members was Scott, John Scott Russell. There's an early uh, print of him. And uh, he was interested in naval architecture. And they wrote three reports. 1844 was their major report to the British Association, whereupon they talk about discoveries mostly made by Russell. And he had observed a localized wave. Before that, you think of waves, you think of periodic kind of waves, but he saw a localized wave. And he uh, said this uh, was a very important wave and used it to design, actually, boats later on called it the Great Wave of Translation, later be known as the Solitary Wave. And you're going to see a lot of solitary waves here. Okay, and I'm going to make a distinction between solitary waves and solitons for two reasons. One, because they're mathematically different, and two, they're physically different. And I'll say a lot more about that during this lecture. And he has this famous quote, such in the month of August 1834 was my first chance interview with that singular and beautiful phenomenon took him 10 years to get it on paper, but he did it. He did some experiments. And if you look at a wave tank and look from the side, you see this hump of water moving down. That's the solitary wave he was talking about. Very easy to produce in the laboratory. And he also uh, looked at combination waves, a small and a big one. He didn't have the big behind the small. He had the small behind the big, because that's naturally what comes out. Had he had the big behind the small, he might have seen what people found later on. And they're depressive waves. They're also very interesting. And he had studied those. And he said, now it remained for the mathematician to predict the discovery after it happened. Well, that's a lot of what mathematicians do. No problem there. But mathematicians and the leading fluid dynamicist at the time, George Airy, of course, was a contentious kind of guy, and something about what Scott Russell said didn't, he didn't like. And he said, uh, not so interesting. It's just a standard wave. Well, uh, Russell said, no, it's a nonlinear wave. You really got to describe it mathematically, because the speed depends on the amplitude, and this is different. And George Airy won the day at that moment, because he was the famous guy. Famous people win the day often in these conversations for a while. And there is <coughs> Jerry. 1840s, Stokes set out the correct boundary conditions for water waves, the non-trivial uh, boundary conditions on the surface. And I'll mention those later. And uh, he found a traveling periodic wave from which we put an envelope on, and the envelope Satisfy as a nonlinear Schrodinger equation, actually, okay, found years later. He made many other contributions, uh, but he, at that time, did not, it, despite the fact he had this periodic wave, he showed the speed depends on the amplitude. It was clearly a nonlinear effect because he demonstrated it with his new equations. Still, he wasn't willing to go against the trend of the day and say Russell was right. It took him 40 years. Say Russell was right. 40. 40. 40. He didn't work only in fluid dynamics, so that may have been part of it. He also set out the uh, correct Navier Stokes equations, which we use all the time. And we use them without an existence proof. And for a million dollars, you can start right now and prove that the solutions exist. Think about what I'm saying. We use the equations, and we don't know the solutions exist. We compute them. Everywhere. Every engineering college 
has groups, not one, groups solving Navier-Stokes equation. Look, you do what you got to do. That's really it. And of course, if you can prove they exist, you get a million dollars and we all feel better. Hopefully they do exist. <laughs> Otherwise we're getting all these answers and they agree with experiments. 1870s, Boussinesque takes Stokes equations, goes to shallow water. Shallow water is a much easier problem. Shallow water, uh, certain approximations make the problem easier. He's able to come up with uh, an approximate equation and solitary wave solution. 20 years later, Kodelig and de Vries also study shallow water, but instead of what Boussinesque primarily was interested in is two directional waves. So you put in a pond, put in a uh, pebble, out comes waves in two directions. Uh, Kodelig and de Vries looked at unidirectional waves, just one direction, get on one of the two directions. And there they are, Boussinesque to the left and Kodelig to the right. Bottom line, he f they found this equation. They call it the Kodelig de Vries equation. You can find elements of it in Boussinesque's work, but really, Kodelig and de Vries spent a whole paper on unidirectional waves, and that's perhaps why we give them all the credit. Also, historically, we didn't know what all of what Boussinesque had found. Can find some of this in his uh, some of his papers. Be that as it may, uh, they also found a periodic nonlinear wave solution from which a limit is the solitary wave. Could it, Russell's work was confirmed. He, everyone agrees. But he wasn't alive. By that time, I don't think he was alive. That often happens. It's unfortunate. One of those things we have to deal with. And here is the equation that they wrote in their paper. Uh, eta is the wave elevation. It can be positive and negative. Uh, here, uh, a third order partial differential equation. Sub t means d a to dt. Square root of g h. g is gravity. h is the mean depth. t, they left in surface tension. Just put it in. If you put surface tension bigger in this normalized sense than one third, the sign changes. So instead of being a positive solitary wave, it's a negative solitary wave. Both of these have been observed in experiments. The uh, large surface tension case was more recent, much more recent. If you non-dimensionalize, move to a traveling frame, you get this equation. We call this the quadratic degrees equation, KDD. Okay, and here's an analytic solution. You plug it in, and it satisfies the equation, and it's hyperbolic secant squared. And when you tell students in calculus, you, here's a hyperbolic function, they get very upset the first time. I still never understand exactly why they like hyperbolic functions, but after a while, you get to love them. At any rate, we love them, and a sesh squared is just a nice bell-shaped structure, and that's it. Now, if you look here, that's a little, a little ugly, but here you see there's a more or less one-dimensional wave structure if you look from the side, you see un unmistakable bell-like structure. Now, of course, that's not exactly Kodelig de Vries' equation, but the first approximation, it tells you there is this hump-like structure, more or less one-dimensional. Then there's some curvature and there's breaking and whatnot. That's not described by Kodelig de Vries' equation. Curvature is described by some other equation that we'll talk about. Now, video. Let's see if I get this video to work. Looks good. Looks good. Maybe make it a little bigger. If you didn't understand what I'm saying before, now you know what a solitary wave is in a laboratory. See that hump there? Localized hump. That's it. Moving right along. And eventually it hits the end, bounces back, and you get some reflection phenomena. But you see it's unidirectional. That's the equation we're talking about and well described by Cordo de Vries. Very well. And people have done experiments and they've also done experiments right near breaking. Just before breaking, you get this hump-like structure and you can go to eight or nine terms and an expansion from full water wave equation. 
to show what goes on. Oops. And if that isn't enough, in July 1995, not too long ago, they recreated the solitary wave on the same canal that Scott Russell did his work, did his observation. This is the Union Canal outside Edinburgh. And in those days, you had uh, barges that filled mostly the whole canal. So when they stopped, they pretty much set forth a unidirectional wave, one dimension. And uh, there was no barges, but there's aqueducts over roads, and that's what they used. And they set this, this uh, uh, little boat right down the aqueduct, stopped, and out set forth this wave. This is the solitary wave. That's its recreation. So 1895 to 1960, pretty much quarter of degrees related to water waves. That's it. 1960s, applied mathematicians started developing robust methods for approximation. What Kordwig and DeVries did is more or less the lines of, well, this term is sort of small because if you do an expansion, there's a third order in amplitude, so drop this, drop that. They had some intuition, but they didn't formalize it. Applied mathematicians formalized the methods of uh, approximation, perturbation analysis, and subsequently in recent years proven rigorously that these methods uh, work. And they found the reduced equation not just from water waves, but from wide physical systems. Any physical system that is almost the wave equation with some small perturbations at quadratic nonlinearity, that'll give you KDV. Similarly, nonlinear Schrodinger, I'll at least write down nonlinear Schrodinger for you here. Um, we have chalk, do we have a chalkboard? This will work? Okay, quarter uh, not only the Schrodinger equation, two dimensions, Laplacian plus kappa a squared a. This is also an equation that's important in optics and uh, in water waves because this equation for the amplitude of call eta amplitude e to the i k dot r minus omega t plus conjugate higher order terms. And omega depends on k in a particular way. Uh, this is the amplitude that, this is the equation that the amplitude satisfies uh, for uh, the envelope of water waves in deep water. But shallow water, you get kdv. At any rate, these equations come up widely. And you just see them everywhere in the context of optics and water waves. In 65, computation on the Kordwick de Vries equation said, hey, something else is going on. Remember I said, well, Scott Russell had the small wave behind the big wave. They did something else. They did the big wave, interact with the small wave, and found a very surprising result, which I'll come back to. That's why they called it solid time. So, Shortly thereafter, uh, Gardner, Green, Kreskel, and Muir, and this is a photograph of Kreskel, who was involved with the 65 and 67 work. These are landmark contributions because they not only saw a physical phenomena, they also found a solution, the method of solving Kordwig de Vries equation in 67. And that was pretty important. It led to many developments, and uh, people were wide of been studying this. It's called the inverse scattering transform. And uh, myself and Harvey Seeger studied it mostly in one dimension and some applications in 81. Two dimensional applications, two dimensions, and uh, integral, integral differential equations in 91. Discrete equations with Pernari and myself and David Trubach. And then more recently, uh, a sort of a more graduate oriented textbook on nonlinear waves with a little bit of of uh, soliton theory. So IST is widely known, and it's sort of the benchmark of what's going on for soliton theory. And the idea is, if you want to take an equation and, and solve it by inverse scattering, you have to relate it to a linear system. Now, that's a job. Yes? So uh, in the derivation of these equations, are they done purely from mathematical 
point of view, or is it governed by some physical attributes or fluid dynamics? Well, uh, in this book in 2011, I start with the original water wave equations, which are physical, and show how you can derive both KDV and nonlinear short circuits. So physics and math are sort of intertwined in some sense, but it's not a, just a mathematical derivation. There's some physics to each of the steps. As far as uh, the inverse scattering transform, you relate it to a linear problem, and one of those linear problems for the KDV equation, interestingly enough, is the time-independent Schrodinger equation, not the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and every eigenvalue of this problem is relates to a solid zone. So you give me initial conditions, I look at a linear problem, I tell you, ah, one eigenvalue, one solid zone. Two eigenvalues, two solid zones. And I talk about IST in the general sense. Uh, let me just leave it to the textbooks without going through it. Um, now here's KDV. Here's a solitary wave solution. That number kappa, two things. First, the speed is 4 kappa squared. The amplitude is 2 kappa squared, so the speed is twice the amplitude. You go to Scott Russell's work, go from non-dimensions and put in the dimensions. It's exactly what he predicted. Kappa is related to the eigenvalue of this linear problem. So if I give you a sesh squared profile, go to the time-independent Schrodinger equation, it has one eigenvalue. That's it. Kappa. Now, what about solitons? Solitons are not solitary waves. One soliton is really a solitary wave. This moves along. Solitary, a soliton, you take a big behind a small. Now, this guy, the speed depends on the amplitude, and it always moves to the right. So it's going to hit this little guy, and there's an interaction. And the big guy comes out in front of the little guy, and there's a phase shift. If it was purely linear, it would not be a phase shift. So the remarkable result is that after the interaction, you have exactly the same size and speed as you had before. That's the notion of a solid ton in one dimension. Now, if you go to the physics literature, you'll see a lot of work. A lot of people talk about solid tons. They mean solitary waves 98%, 99% of the time. It's not that easy to find a, a solid ton in physics in one dimension because you have two waves, you have to see that they interact, you have to find that the big one goes through the little one that has more or less the same speed. There's always some damping around, there's always some issues. But I'm going to try to convince you that every day, you here, every day can see a soliton interaction. I can't see it so easily in Boulder, but you can do it more easily here. So, so I'm sorry, it's just a question here. Sure. So the, the, uh, the qualifier then of solitons has to do with the conservation of the parameters? Of the That's right. The eigenvalues are preserved in time because of the way this uh, solution works. And so there's one eigenvalue for this, one eigenvalue for this. They come through. The eigenvalues are preserved, but the phase shift has also is preserved, but it's sort of built into the solution. And I'll show you later how it's built in. So now I'm going to morph into water waves. The water wave equations. Well, uh, you have water, bottom, and there's two dimensions of where I'm developing it here, x1, x2. And then there's a vertical direction y. And uh, for much of it, it's quite easy. The, del, the Laplacian of phi is 0 everywhere in the domain. So you go, ah, this problem's easy. The phi dy, phi is the velocity potential, so its derivative is velocity. The v dy is zero on the bottom, no vertical velocity. Problem's easy. That's probably why uh, they had the competition in France. Laplace's equation, it, they knew that Laplace's equation was involved with waterways, but then you have these two complicated boundary conditions. The so-called uh, kinematic condition and the, uh, the particles on the surface stay on the surface and in a pressure condition. I leave in surface tension. Sigma's T over <coughs> one. Okay? Well, at least this problem is hard because it's nonlinear, and it's on a free surface you don't know. Eta and phi you have to solve. You have to solve phi throughout the domain. So it's a hard problem. And mathematicians have handled it by saying eta is small. 
I'm doing perturbation where I'm smaller than the typically what they do. Uh, and here's a picture of this. Here's the, the middle range, the domain, with Laplace's equation. Here's the free boundary. And there is the velocity potential on the free surface. Well, to make a long story short, my colleague and I studied this problem, colleagues and I studied this problem, and reduced the problem to what we consider then, and I still consider simply formulation. With Foucault and Maslamani, we formulated into two equations. For Q, the velocity potential on the free surface, this integral differential equation, and this equation here, which comes from the pressure condition. So now you have an equation for eta and Q, two equations, two unknowns, no free surface. The price you pay is integral differential equation. Okay? And we were able to get some results, new results out of this. And uh, subsequently, people have been studying this and finding new results. And I'm not going to uh, discuss the theory behind this at all. Just say, here we have these equations. We derive them. And cap is a free parameter, which we use sort of like a Fourier transform concept, <coughs> not a Fourier transform. And uh, we were able to derive approximate equations and also these higher order solitary waves, ten, ten orders. I mean, comes right out. Why? Because what we do is expand Cauchy and Sinch <coughs> around uh, eta. If eta is small, just expand because Cauchy and Sinch have uh, analytic expansions. But there's more to say there. Does, does, that, does, that, does that system apply for periodic waves? It looks as though you have to have decay at infinity. We put in decay in this, but people, yeah. and we told the people how you can put in periodic okay. boundary conditions. So periodic it works. But if you say, what about the edge problems in my infinite? There's a lot of issues in that need to still be dealt with uh, to do general boundary conditions. But periodic is OK. And we derive some new integral relations and conserved quantities, and KDV and LS, and in two dimensions, Benny Luke and Kadams of Pethiashvili, which I'll talk about. And then we showed it connected to studies that people have made in the Dirichlet Norman series. And uh, also in interfacial waves. So suppose you non-dimensionalize. Well, mathematicians like to non-dimensionalize. Physicists can just compute the equation directly. They don't non-dimensionalize. They, they know what the scales are. It's not absolutely critical you do it, but I'm being an applied mathematician and perturbationalist. I like small parameters. So you normalize the x1 direction with the typical wavelength L, the horizontal, the Transverse direction, gamma over L, some amplitude, and you have a speed. And you put all this into the integral, uh, these two equations. You get, your non, you get small parameters, expand, cinch, and cosh. We'll just take two terms, and out pops immediately this equation. This was, for Q, the velocity potential on the free surface, written down by Benny and Luke in 64 without surface tension. But this sigma twiddle codes in this surface tension minus a third. This is really what same number that uh, Cordelig and Debye said. And um, you have a scale of Laplacian with gamma and bi Laplacian, et cetera. And so if you take this equation, you see there you have the wave equation. So really, it's telling you you have waves moving in two directions. And if you go into one direction of waves, and take epsilon and mu squared and gamma squared proportional to each other, out comes this equation. Now, remember this, ut plus 6 mm -hmm. u ux plus u triple x? That was KDV. This is the modification of KDV, the correct modification that has the correct balance. Okay? And it's called the Kadams and Pefiashvili equation after they, who derived it in 1970, later, uh, a few years later, Harvey Seeger and I derive the water waves. And I will try to convince you that for water waves, it tells you a lot. For ocean waves, it tells you a lot. I'm sorry, what was sigma again? Sigma is surface tension, non-dimensional surface tension. And this is very strange number a third, which mathematicians have known about for years. And they look near a third and around a third. And you get all sorts of approximations near a third. But basically, when you're bigger than a third or smaller than a third, if you do pure KDV, bigger, ordinary water is near, sigma, uh, surface tension is near zero. You just get a hump, positive hump. When sigma is greater than a third, you use mercury. 
sigma for the kinds of experiments they did, those, those length scales, it was about two thirds. You get a negative hump. Well, uh, this quarter, this uh, kadamson peffier equation depends critically on that sign. If the sign is positive, which means sigma is a very large surface tension, we find an exact solution, which is a lump. I'll give it to you here. Well, um, we have some kind of simple understanding about this one third, you know. Just uh, right now, mathematically, we say, OK, bigger than one third, how, you know. The only thing I can say is that's where the dispersion changes sign. That's the critical thing. The dispersion changes sign at one third. It's similar to deep water. Deep water, you have famous Benjamin Fear instability. Benjamin Fear instability, a periodic wave, will be unstable in deep water. But there's a critical number when the wave is stable. And that comes because of a change of sign of dispersion. That's it. So the change of dot and sign of dispersion occurs at sigma equals a third. That's the critical. So it's, that's what, what tells you. When sigma is bigger than a third, which is very hard to produce in a laboratory, because you have to use things like mercury and they're difficult to work with, uh, you get this solution. And there it is. There's a picture of it. There's a sign change. It's actually, in the physical notion, a negative lump moving along. And it's exact solution. It's not yet been observed. So there's a problem. Forget the, dis the data analysis, stop it, get into the laboratory tomorrow. And Mark Hof has a laboratory. He said, Is it stable? Uh, in KP, it's stable. Yes. By higher order corrections? Uh, to all orders, we don't know, but certainly it's stable within KP. Within KP theory, it's, uh, it's stable. Yeah. Uh, and within water waves, uh, I can't say because I don't know precisely what the studies are for stability on that. But my guess is it is stable. Okay? For NLS, the equivalent thing, or maybe Stuart says not stable. But you may not know that there is such a solution for full water wave theory. We don't know. Right. We do have higher order approximations, but what we can do is look at this within the context of KP with perturbations that come from water waves. You're right. Uh, people have proven there is a lump for water waves, I think. Uh, what's his name, uh, the fellow in Britain? He proved it rigorously, but I don't think he has analytic Holland? construction. Who? Toland? Not Toland. Uh, one of the disciples. <laughs> Maybe his, his name just escapes me, but he's a very, very good analyst. But I'm going to talk about ocean waves. Ocean waves, sigma is near zero. So sigma twiddle is negative. So this sign is a negative sign. And this is the equation. And we don't know of any lumps for this equation. At least nobody's produced any. We don't think there are any. But there are another class of solutions. Now, when you get a nonlinear wave equation, it's one thing to get it, and study it, and compute with it. It's another thing to try to look for some of the important solutions. And here are the solutions that people knew back for many years. Uh, the second log of, of f, f is a, is a uh, series of exponentials. 1 plus e to the a to 1 is the first one. 1 plus e to the a to 1, a to 2, and is the e to the a 1, 2 term here. And a is linearly dependent on x, y, and t. And if you take this one and plug it in, the first one, f1, there's a picture of it. It's just a solitary wave. No difference. OK? And p is the slope in the y direction. In one dimension, it doesn't matter. I mean, for, for the first solution, doesn't matter. But the second solution matters a lot. Now, you see that e to the a12 term? If there was no p and no y, this is exactly that phase shift I told you about. It comes through. And you plot that solution, and you get exactly what I described in that figure earlier. I said, you know, one dimension, hard, this, that, the other thing. I said it, right? But I said, here you are. In North Carolina, you can see solitary. Uh, what the hell is he talking about? Well, now I'm going to talk about two-dimensional interacting waves. Because two-dimensional and two solitons. F2 is a two-soliton solution. 
but in two dimensions. Makes a big difference. And notice the e to the a12. Its magnitude, its size matters. Well, here's one dimensional solid time. But here's the KP line solid time. Do you see that interaction? This is a case where e to the a12 is order one. A little blip. And here's a case when e to the a12 is very large. You get what we call an X wave with a long stem. And here's a case where e to the a12 is zero. That long stem just goes off to infinity. And here's a case e to the a12 is very small. Call this an H wave. Now notice when e to the a12 goes to zero, one of these guys goes out, and you're left with just this. Now, I was on the beach, and I saw what I thought were these things. I took some photos. But before that, actually, in my book with Harvey, we knew of one picture from the beach. And we knew this, and we published it, of course. We actually knew about this picture. It was sent to us uh, by Pat Weidman. And you see this line solid time here. And you see that phase shift with that long stem. We knew one. We said, this occurs once every 50 years. Who knew? The answer is it occurs every day. Every day. Here's a picture from Mexico of a short stem wave, x wave. Here's a short stem. Here's that solution I told you about. Here's the solution looking from the top. Here is that beach in Mexico. It's long, just goes on for miles, very flat at low tide. If you go at low tide, and there's an, typically the afternoon, there's enough wind to create cross waves. There's always a dominant wave coming in. See the dominant wave there. But with wind, there starts to be interactions. And if you get those interactions at low tide, there's enough shallow water and enough flatness to give you what we claim is an approximation to KP. Intuitively, uh, you know, one can say, uh, here I'm speaking as an engineer, it kind of makes sense that at, at some point these things are going to positively interfere or constructively interfere and, and form that. W what are the conditions exactly? I, I must have missed that. When so, does that happen exactly? Okay, uh, so you're asking, phase or something. you're asking when do you get this? Right. Okay, well, First, you need to have a situation where you have a dominant wave. That's coming in. They're always there. Those long waves are always coming in. What you need is a cross wave. And you need one that's coming in that's pretty long. It's got a lot of energy because it's got to be, there's, say this is the dominant one, then there's got to be a cross one coming in. That comes typically from wind. Now, you ask about con constructive interference. Two positive waves that are line solid times always give you a positive hump. What's incredibly surprising to me is that sometimes and frequently you see these long stems. And then frequently you see Ys. Because Ys, you say, are not generic from the solution, very rarely. Because this is not a generic res result. This is e to the a12 small. So you would think this generically should happen many, many more times than this. But in fact, it doesn't. So for me, it's the surprise that you get all four cases, e to the a12 zero, e to the a12 small, e to the a12 large, and e to the a12 order one all the time, every day. When you get the stem, it's, it's elongated in time. I'll right? show it to you. Right. You can decide. The superposition is not linear. No, it's not linear. Add, it's smaller than if they were just added. Bigger. Is it bigger? Bigger. Oh, okay. But almost factor of twice bigger. In other words, if they add, it's factor of two. Okay. You can get up to three point, you can get up to four in KP theory, put in the correction, you get 3.8. Okay, here's another beach. After I found some of these pictures, my my student at the time, Douglas Baldwin, said, I'm going to try to look for it in California. Drove out to California. First beach, Newport Beach. Do a lot of surfing in Newport Beach. No good. Too deep. Now, there's something else going on there. There are definitely 
non-trivial line type interactions, but not studied by KP theory. This beach has all the phenomena I saw. Plus, I didn't look for H waves. It was only when I came back and told Douglas, he said, well, what about the other limit? That's what he found here. He found the H waves. So here's uh, another picture of a long stem. Here are two long stems, one from Mexico. See which one? The top one's California, bottom one's Mexico. And here's a typical solution. Here's a very long stem. Very long stem. Again, Mexico, California. Here's a Y. Here's an H. Notice this guy and this guy are very big relatively to the middle there. How long can long stems be? I don't know how long, but they're very long in practice. And now I'm going to give you some videos. Oh, wait, before I give you videos, here's sometimes you get more complex waves. Dominant wave comes in, you get two going to the top and three going to the bottom. Much rarer that you see these more complicated waves, but you do see them. Uh, here's sunset. Now, beach movies. Why did I say you could do this more easily than me? From here, how long a ride is it to the beach? Two hours. Two hours. Tomorrow. No data analysis. <laughs> to the beach. Longer. Then <laughs> so you know longer why it's better to do <laughs> not many ways. <laughs> Question. Yeah. So it is something about this, what you said. Uh, you said these, uh, these waves are solutions to some approximations to solutions, not the exact solutions. So you have real water waves. I gave you those equations. They're pretty hard to deal with, even in the even in the reformulation. What we do is we approximate the true water wave equations by approximate equations. We get down to the first nonlinear effect. It's the KP equation in two dimensions, shallow water. So the two approximations: weak at small amplitude, shallow water. That's what's going on in KP. And now you say, well. Does KP re reflect what uh, ocean waves? I sure think so, based on all these observations. But I can't prove that yet because, you know, there isn't a, a wave laboratory on the ocean. Certainly in laboratories, they've shown KP is a good approximation to water waves. So is this taken advantage of in engineering? I can see how, for instance, for uh, generation, you know, like uh, pulse generation or something. If, if you can have this nonlinear resonance in some sense for, for much cheaper uh, by, well, by generating these, these waves, no? Uh, it depends on the kind of engineering you're looking at. I'll get back to that in a second. But in some kinds of engineering, yes, it can be quite relevant. So I'm going to look at short stem here. You see that uh, wave up there? Take a look at your television. Tell me if you see how it's developed. See how it develops? You see the way they come in, interact? Just sometimes those cross waves just appear out of nothing. You have to watch waves for a long time. That means give update analysis for a long time. And watch those waves after a few days there. You really, it is data analysis. You really see it. Here, okay, so these are the short waves. Whoops, let me go backwards. Let me give you the long stem. This is Jim's question. Okay. How big is big? How big can they be? We've seen... How big do two Ys in either direction look like a long stem? Yes, they do. There. They look how long that thing is. Wow. There's a longish one, but not... It's funny because the, the one-dimensional waves are, going, are in different locations. There's an offset. Yeah. But at, out at infinity, if once, when they were a one-dimensional wave, they're all in the same... They're the same, but they have to so get that phase shift. That, yeah. The interaction is what does it. And that's why I said these are day-to-day, -day, these are soliton, solitons you see every day. These are not solitary waves by any means. Then you say, what about the Y waves? Uh, let's get back to Ys. There's sort of a Y up there, another Y. 
down to the lower left. There's a Y coming. Here's a nice Y. That egret's just running away from it. And you notice there's no, I mean, maybe there's some other piece that wants to come up, but for all extensive purposes, it's a Y. We, uh, I can also show you webs, but let me move on. Uh, last year, over six hours, we counted 65 interactions one afternoon, uh, over three day, over a six hour period, I think it was a couple of days. And 35% short, 25% long stem, 25% wide H, smaller, and 5% the complex structures. This summer, Douglas is going to go and do, uh, take videos, because we're counting and Sometimes you say, is that an X, is that a Y, they're not absolutely sure. Are those two Y stuck together. What's really happening there? He's going to take full on videos. You've got to get a balloon this. with a camera pointing down or a little UAV or well, something. Well, he's, also going, to, he's <laughs> also going to take the lasers and try to measure the amplitude, try to do this uh, better than we, we have. This was published in Physics Review last year and uh, was published in Physics Today and Siam News from a newsworthy point of view. Now, tsunami propagation. First, take a look at the left. On the left over here, these were experiments done by Maxworthy back in 80 because the Y and the Y junctions were found by Miles in 77. And what Maxworthy did is, look, we know KP also applies to internal waves. So he studied internal waves and he built uh, a cylindrical wave generator. So there's cylindrical waves. You see that first guy over here? And he watched how it propagated. And you developed a bigger and bigger stem over the propagation. Fast forward to the Tohoku tsunami of 2011. Well, when that tsunami occurred, there was a satellite photograph of it right over the tsunami. And you see where the tsunami was going. And you see these are essentially the X interactions that occurred due to the tsunami on roughly, if you will, cylindrical interactions. And these guys caused far more damage than just the ordinary tsunami. So it was a tsunami 9.4 or something, it was an earthquake 9.4. It was an enormous tsunami, but it was magnified due to these things. And they, here's a later photograph, and the damage that came from that was very, very great. Okay, And uh, so the point is, if you have tsunami interactions over a long distance, that could have a very, very bad effect, because over long distances, you have KP. Over long distances, the magnitude is not a factor of 2. It's a factor of 3.7, 3.8. Could be, could be enormous. OK, now I don't know how much time I have left. Eight minutes. So I'll go very quickly. I'll just hit the main points of uh, optics. So I've been studying nonlinear optics for a while and uh, studied fiber optics and mode lock lasers. And um, well, the equations in fiber optics are Maxwell's equations, but can't solve Maxwell's equations over 10,000 kilometers where you need to send signals. So you need to do approximations. You go through the approximation theory, for, starting from Maxwell's equations, what comes out, nonlinear Schrodinger equations. And that's how people develop the theory for fiber optic communications, based on approximations of nonlinear Schrodinger type in fiber optics. And then interestingly, uh, mode lock lasers more recently, because of people in Boulder who are very interested in that, uh, mode lock lasers, because of optical clock technology, uh, it turns out that nonlinear Schrodinger and soliton play a critical role there. But we've begun to be interested in a different problem called photonic lattices. And the reason that caught our attention is that in certain cases, you don't have nonlinear Schrodinger equations. You have totally different equations. And I'm an equation guy. Down, down, root, bottom, I like to look at new equations. 
and I like to see what those equations predict. So, yes, I don't mind walking on the beach, especially in the winter, but equations are what drive the mathematics. And there are new lattices that we've been studying, and they're related to graphene. How? Because the lattices have the same structure, they're called honeycomb lattices, as graphene. And so graphene has new properties that are relate that are new for materials, but now port them to optics. They're new material new phenomena in optics. So here's a one-dimensional lattice. Not really a lattice, it's one dimensional periodic waveguide. Take an optical material, you carve in little ridges and send in a laser. If you send in a low power, Here's the output at the back end. It, low power, diffracts or disperses, if you will. At higher power, it coagulates, it becomes focused. At very high power, you get a stripe. This is just a stripe down the first few waveguides. Well, a few years, this was the late 90s. It was first predicted mathematically, actually by uh, Christodelides. Then uh, a few years later, people said, well, let's build a photonic rectangular lattice, okay, where you have minima and maxima, minima degrees. And they tried to re do, redo the experiments. Here is low power diffraction. At high power, you get what they call two-dimensional soliton, or my, our language, a two-dimensional solid tree wave. Just sat there, no question. And this was done by Segev's group in, uh, at the Technion. And the previous work was done by Silverberg's group at Weizmann. Well, the governing equation, you might say, is not too far from here. From Maxwell's equation, it's pretty easy in, in steady state optics to get this equation here, where V of R is this potential that has the max and the min. We're not satisfied as mathematicians because there's a lot of local structure here. There's a lot of local structure. We want to get rid of the local structure. And so the game is to devise approximation methods so that when you get an equation like this, there's no more local V of R because it's too much, too much information. We want to average over it. We call it some kind of averaging theory. Okay? So um, here's the simple rectangular lattice. From this point, you get all other points. This point, V1, V2, you get this point. You can take V1, you get this point. Here's a honeycomb lattice, okay? And from this black point, you get this black point through V1 and V2, and then V1, V2, but you don't get the white points. So you need two vectors, to, two, two points to start with. We call this a non-simple lattice. This structure is exactly the structure of graphene. The atomic structure of graphene is here. And so let me summarize what the results are for graphene. Well, it's a very interesting and sexy material for physicists. Okay? It has high, super, it has high conductivity, high, uh, a very, very strong material. It's one of the strongest materials around. And it's easy to manufacture thanks to experiments that were only done in 2004. Well, to produce a honeycomb lattice like this is rather easy. You sum three waves. So in the, in the laboratory, you can produce these mater this uh, honeycomb structure. So instead of having, you know, white, 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 I mean, red, blue, red, blue, you find red, red, and then the blues are on a hexagonal structure. Okay, and I can show you some pictures of that. At any rate, it's easy to produce in the laboratory. The issue is, what kind of mathematical equations do you get? It turns out they're very different, very different than you would find in a simple lattice. And that's what dri has driven a lot of our research. Um, I talk a little bit about honeycomb lattices here, material graphene. Um, it's considered the queen of the material world now. First demonstrated in 2004, Nobel Prize in 2010 extreme conductivity. Mathematically, its dispersion structure is special. And everything has to do with the dispersion structure. Now, you take 
take a signal, take its Fourier transform. You're in Fourier space. Well, when you have periodic lattices, we have what's called block theory. And block theory has a dual space, from physical space to a dual space. The dual space has very special properties. They have Dirac points where the bands touch, and that changes the mathematics greatly. That's the whole story. So, Segev's group has done experiments in theory, very nice. We've been, uh, mostly their theory is computational. We've been doing these nonlinear uh, approximations and studying what you get from that. Weinstein and Pfefferman, there's many levels. First, you start with the physicists and the computation, and we applied mathematicians come in, do some uh, approximations, get the underlying phenomena. Pure mathematicians come in, I mean, Pfefferman is a pretty important guy. Weinstein is a great mathematician. They come in and study it much more mathematically, improve a lot of the things that, that we don't have time for and can't do. <laughs> say we can't do, we just say, yeah, yeah, we have no, no time. What can we do? We can't do what we have to do. And I won't go through block theory. Here, let me show you some pictures. Here's a picture of a honeycomb lattice from the top. The periodic here are the maxima, the minima on this uh, Star of David type structure. And here's the dispersion relation of the block theory. And these points are called direct points, and they're the critical feature underlying the math that change the mathematics. So if you do math here, it's very, very different from doing math there. And here's a physical experiment. Uh, no, not physical. Here's the computation on the uh, original nonlinear equations, the, the lattice equations that you, you start with. Uh, the lattice nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Here's our approximate theory here. And depending on some initial conditions, you can get notches in the data. And here's an experiment they did in the laboratory. You start here and it evolves. And what you get is not solitons, you get an evolution of a nonlinear structure with what I consider notches. And we were able to predict that. Um, now we're looking at deformations of lattices and edges. You put an edge, it changes the problem dramatically. So instead of two-dimensional complete lattice, you put a lattice with one edge. Turns out then you can have unidirectional waves move. Remember unidirectional waves? Did I talk about unidirectional waves in this lecture? Yes, I did. Here you get them not just for the nonlinear case, but the linear case. And there's some underlying topology, which you guys would love, another reason to move into some lattice problems, and I won't go through any more. Let me just oh, conclude. Not only waves and water and optics, I talked about the history and general discussion, and formulated the water wave equations of a non-local spectral system. What motivates us is asymptotic systems, and in shallow water, I talked about the Benny Luke and KP equations and showed you some pictures of lion solitons on beaches. And you can e extend the whole theory to interfacial flows on multiple fluids. And in optics, there's underlying it is what we call the tight binding limit. There's a case where the potential is very large and very deep. And so the key approximation is you only need the minimum of the potential, and you have to approximate that correctly. And then from that minimum potential, in each periodic cell, you get what we call an orbital or approximating function uh, that approximates the eigenfunction, the linear eigenfunction or the block function in that cell. And they add them all up and then put in an envelope. So simple lattices, you get nonlinear Schrodinger systems. And in honeycomb lattices, you get new, new, new things. And we're doing work on lattice deformation and edge modes and working with uh, Yi Zhu, who's a postdoc of mine now. He's at uh, Tsinghua University in China and uh, is a professor. And Chris Curtis just moved to uh, San Diego State. And so we're working with, with those guys. And that's all I have to say today. Thank you. We have uh, time for some questions. 30 seconds for questions. 
So in some contexts, surface tension is smoothing, but in your case, it's playing the role of dispersion. Yeah, right. that's right. So it changes the sign of dispersion quite, it's quite dramatic actually, yeah. Well, I'll give you another example to reiterate this point. Uh, suppose you uh, look at the envelope problem. So you take a progressive wave, put an envelope. Now the coefficients, I, I wrote this thing here in this way, but here's the water wave equation actually. I A tau plus U uh, A X X U2 A Y Y plus kappa A squared A. All these guys depend on surface tension. Every one. This is always positive. Turns out this is always positive. This guy, even though the surface tension, this guy can change sign, depending on surface tension. Now, I'll tell you another result mathematically. Suppose they're both positive, everything's positive. I take a Gaussian initial condition with enough energy. It blows up in finite time. So water waves can actually have collapse. Now, we haven't seen that demonstrated water waves, but in optics, the same thing happens, and you see collapse. So surface tension has this mysterious property of changing the sign and allowing collapse to occur. Now, I'm not answering your question. I'm just telling you a sequence of facts that have always surprised me. It still surprises You're me. Surface tension has play, can play various roles and give surprising results. It plays various roles, surprising results, and it's all in the sign of the dispersion. But you can't say, oh, I have surface tension, therefore it's going to keep things together. Because collapse can occur. So then looking, looking ahead, um, if, if you were to be able to better model waves and understand these phenomena, could you also do things like design ships that their propeller disturb the, make, make less noise for the, for the fish, or uh, design fish that are, uh, design ships that are faster? Um, could you design, let's say, piping systems and sewage systems where uh, there are going to be less wave disturbances, and because of that, uh, less material can be used? You know, they don't need to be quite as strong uh, to handle various unexpected stuff, can these things eventually appear out of this work? Well, uh, the answer is yes to everything. <laughs> you see, because it, it depends on which area of application motivates you. Um, so years ago, the Navy had a big interest in soliton waves because as they move through, uh, in, as they move through the uh, uh, ocean, or they move up the ocean, they go through thermoclines and they set off wave phenomena and therefore if they set off certain kinds of signature waves you can detect it. So that's interesting to the Navy both from a positive and negative point of view. You don't want your submarine to come up and set off any waves so you have to build something different. So you have to change your structure. Uh, and that was a big problem for, for quite a while till they understood it better. Um, and uh, as far as ships we go back to Scott Russell. He designed the Great Eastern, so one of the big ships of the 1800s, uh, which was a sail slash power boat. It was both. And he designed it based on minimizing drag due to solitons, solitary waves. Why should a solitary wave be so important in the middle of the ocean? I don't know. Uh, another problem today that's very interesting and is popular is freak waves. So you say, well, what is a freak wave? Do people know what a freak wave is? Well, maybe you do, but I'll tell you something about it. You get these big tankers. They like to travel along um, uh, currents that help them. Well, it turns out that m rather frequently, rather frequently, these uh, ships get hit by enormous waves. Freak waves, they say. You, know, you don't see them all the time. Once in a while. Forget that discussion. Let's go to optics. In a very important paper six or seven years ago, some people doing fiber optics 
did experiments, and they found that freak waves could be observed and char characterized a huge number of times. In other words, they're freak, but they're easy to produce in the laboratory. What's the common denominator between the two subjects? Nonlinear Schrodinger equation. In deep order, nonlinear Schrodinger equation for water waves, for fiber optics, nonlinear Schrodinger equation. If you understand the dynamics of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, you have some idea about how often freak waves occur. Freak waves occur. Here's the bad news, rather often. <laughs> So the next time you go on, on your favorite carnival ship, just remember a freak wave could be there. But all kidding aside, uh, there are certain cases where freak waves can occur. And I find it interesting, it's the same model equation in two different applications. And what does fiber optics have to do with water waves and freak waves? So in terms of an engineering design, you'd want to be able to design your ship to A, avoid the freak waves, to understand the freak waves, and understand when they occur, how to build your ship so that it doesn't destroy you. I have seen some of the destruction of these freak waves. It is substantive, and they're hundreds of millions of dollars. So these are engineering problems. They're, they're all over. So what, what could we do without engineers? We'd be, really? we'd be lost. What I say? We'd be lost it's without engineers. Thank God for engineers. Actually, I do have one last question. I, I know we're, we're actually out of time, but... Uh, it's okay with me. I'm here all, I'm here all yeah. afternoon. The, uh, <laughs> you know, the, I was actually fascinated by, uh, by that thing about the, the honeycomb uh, lattice that you were talking about. It, it turns out that actually in, in, in uh, sampling and signal processing and sampling and things, there are such structures, that, but we have never actually been able to really... Uh, there is the, this, uh, this called, actually, honeycomb sampling. Mm -hmm. And and uh, which supposed to be uh, very very efficient and everything, but we never actually took advantage of it. it uh, to my knowledge, it's never been exploited all that much. Mm -hmm. Do you know if there is a, any connection between people what people are doing in sampling and? Uh, I I don't know. No? I've le learned about honeycomb lattices only because a you know how you mathematics of how you derive envelope equations in these periodic structures, and then finding in periodic structures, the key word is block theory. In Fourier transform, you just take a Fourier transform block theory, it's a little bit more complicated. You get an equation which has a dispersion relation involved with it. And that dispersion relation changes dramatically due to the honeycomb structure. So it's like you saying this. If I want to do uh, uh, some kind of, of sampling, well, do you, do you sample with Fourier transforms or do you just sample some other way? I would say with a honeycomb structure, probably Fourier transforms are not the way to go, but some sort of block type decomposition is the way to go. And so block structure is so block B-L-O-C-H. B -L -O -C -H. And all it means is this. The equation, the eigenfunctions that govern the phenomena satisfy this. Laplacian phi plus, I guess we like, minus V of R phi equals mu phi. V is the potential. That's honeycomb structure. It's Laplacian. So it's, the, it's just nothing but a Schrodinger operator. And now that's mu, but what we know is that phi of R can be related to a function u through this transformation, e to the ik dot r, uh, and u is periodic in r. In r and in k, and mu through this transformation is the block uh, dispersion relation. And that picture I showed you was the dispersion relation of this block function. And this plays a critical role. If mu is 1, then it's just, if u is 1, that is, v of r is 0, then it's just, uh, you know, wave-like operator, and that's where you get Fourier transforms. u is 1, it's reduced to Fourier transforms. So if I were going to say anything, look for block theory underlying your honeycomb observations. All right. So thank our speaker again. Thank you.
Thank you.